the first day of Christmas. Oh, no, it's not the first day of Christmas, is it? It's the first of December. And Gig Stories listeners, Christmas is coming. Alex is getting fat. Christopher's recording this wearing a woolly hat. It's all true. It's all true. Welcome to a slightly delayed episode of the Gig Stories podcast. And as I, as or, or as, as we, dang it, I've given it away who sent that message, as we put out on social media, both Chris and I were whisked off to Lapland uh, to help Father Christmas, which is sort of almost a true story. So apologies if you were waiting eagerly Monday morning for a new episode. Um, but here it is, better late than never. And boy, is it a cracker. I really, really enjoyed this chat. But first, I feel like, Chris, we have all kinds to catch up on because it seems like a while since we've uh, since we've spoken. Well, do you know what? It's, I think it's the first time that for an intro, outro recording that we do, mm. um, yeah. I've had to write things down because I don't want to forget anything. Oh, yeah, listeners, if any of you were... Uh, under any illusion that there's any preparation put into this. Um, no, Chris doesn't write a single thing. He doesn't need to, because apparently I do all the talking. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's the point? What is the point? I, the only things I write down are like on an A4, just go, stop talking now, Alex. We, and then just we, show we... it to the screen. Stop talking now. As you know, we record this on Zoom and and... You know, after episode number eight, see at the at the at the end of an interview, seeing Chris just slowly screw up his ball of paper and just throw it into the bin and stare into the distance and think, <laughs> maybe next episode I'll get to ask a question. I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't yeah. do that to him anymore. So um he's now allowed to ask two questions per interview. And then but... stare off into the middle distance. <laughs> Um, or nip to the loo yeah or you know that's been known or or various things so yeah we have got loads now come on let's uh, let's um let's stay on brand it's the gig stories podcast two or is it three mondays ago i and we witnessed what i think is one of the best performances by a band i've seen so chris and i were very lucky to be at the charlatans nhs gig in gorilla in manchester and i think you know better than me chris what would have been the few hundred two three hundred maybe maybe just over 300 but no not much more than that yeah so it was it is about the size of chris's living room um (laughs) (laughs) sorry it's the size of Lord Chris's uh, living room. Um, Which one? So Which we, one, Alex? <laughs> exactly. And I've seen the charlatans an awful lot over the years. And I, I flippantly on the night said, that's in my top three charlatans performances. But I said that because I didn't think about it. Because I'm actually trying to think, all right, where does that come? And it is absolutely up there. They were incredible and that the the atmosphere from them they were just smiling at each other really visibly enjoying it and 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 as for the set list oh my goodness me yeah it was Inc- knockout it was what well, it really was chris you were you were shooting it weren't you how was it for the first few songs it was there's great. no barrier there's no barrier is there yeah yeah, absolutely. No, it was it was great. It was great, and um, yeah, just kind of pootled around the front, and um, it was all it was all kind of it wasn't you know everyone crammed in. It didn't feel like that. No, um, no. Um, NHS not, workers are very polite gig goers. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Although several of them were quite tall, I seem I seem to remember they, they were quite tall. Um, like, oh, yes. well, he's, he's a biggin. Yes, um, and where did he stand? In front of you. In, exactly. Was, and you're not a big one. No, I am not. Or an NHS worker. So no. I'll, I'll make do. So if, I'm going to assume, Chris, that someone like, not someone like Tim Burgess, Tim Burgess. <laughs> Tim Burgess is, he's a bit of a gift, isn't he, to photograph? 
Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it, it was it was only about five or six weeks ago that I photographed him at night and day doing his solo stuff. Sound check. The sound check, yeah. Before the before the gig even started, I, I photographed yeah. the sound check. Um, but I've photographed. I mean, I've seen the charlatans a load of times. Um, but I've photographed. I photographed Tim when his first solo album came out. I think it was his first oh, solo album. Yeah, so about 20, 2014, maybe early 2014, something like that. Okay. Um, and uh, that was at Band on the Wall. So that was, that was almost, I mean, that was comparable size, but it wasn't, you know, the charlatans. It was, it was Tim doing new stuff, um, you know, new solo stuff. And was it the um, Oh No, I Love You album? With the black him head and shoulders on the front, yeah, black and white. Was yeah. that twenty fourteen? No, no, no. That that was uh, twenty twelve into into twenty thirteen. Yeah, it would have been twenty twelve ish. Okay, well, I only started photography in twenty thirteen, so um, wow, yeah. Uh, so he was one of the first people you shot. Yeah, yeah. I didn't. I, yeah, I, I tended to photograph people at Band on the Wall because I knew uh, Malcolm um, at Band on the Wall, and he said, "Yeah, come along and shoot, shoot what you want." So, I, I oh, shot Mal, and... Malk, the big M, yeah, Mal the big M. yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, oh, we should get Malcolm Duffin on. Actually, he's great. Oh, I bet he's seen some gigs. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, so I, I photographed um, loads of stuff and from jazz to folk to um, the magic band, you know, the. Um, yeah. Yeah. So photographed them and um, Sam Lee um, folk musician and uh, some some jazz dudes and. Um, and yeah. Tim Burgess. And Tim Burgess. Yeah. And so in that one, he he absolutely locked eyes with my camera and I got a, a really lovely shot, one which I really like, um, of him just looking straight down the barrel. Um oh, and he's done you that. Show us that one. Can you show us that one? Yeah, I will I will pop it on the, the, the website. Actually, I just got a print of it um delivered today. Um uh I, I ordered a few prints um because I am <laughs> <laughs> shameless plug i am selling prints of my my work yeah yeah absolutely check out chris's just remind us of the website i'm no shame yeah, yeah, uh, yeah absolutely yeah chris uh, but yeah the next time i photographed charlatans was at the apollo um and again he looked straight down the camera and it's just nice when when musicians do that they acknowledge the presence of a, a photographer uh, yeah yeah I, I i like that and and like i said in a previous podcast um when when i was at night and day he did you know kind of look at me as i started photographing and gives a big smile and just kind of that's went, good yep it's cool it's fine and um yeah it was just just nice yeah he's yeah I, yeah he's he's good to shoot and he was he was really on form i mean they they, they all were for for those of you who are charlatan's fans have a look at tim's twitter because he's been posting the set lists from this tour and it is breathtaking now they've always been good but they are pulling it out of the bag and they are playing some stuff they haven't played for a long time you know jesus hairdo is coming out um haven't they i think they've played can't get out of bed on this tour yeah yeah i noticed that um but for me and this is uh we've mentioned this maybe a few times and i think it'll it's going to be a, a question that'll come up more because i like it i love the start of gigs and they are back to i say back they've started playing forever as the as the opener and oh what a start to a gig um and even in gorilla where it's very small the band come on not tim still fairly dark and then you just hear 
Martins. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, it's just incredible. And then Tim wanders on and poof, it's into forever. It's just, they're a, a phenomenal band. Yeah, and again, I I'd, I'd like the music that plays before the band even gets on as well. So I felt, mm. I mean, so what? one of the pieces of music, again, this will probably have been, I know we talked about this um, just before Ren Harview's interview. No, it was about, oh. we were talking about the Ren Harview gig that I went to see. Oh, right, yes. And talking yeah. about the music that played before. Um, oddly enough, that was Gorilla as well. Um but a uh, theme from Cinema Paradiso played. And, yes. Um, before they came on, it was maybe about four or five tunes before they came on. But yeah, it was just lovely. It just kind of got got the crowd into kind of really, it was a nice warm buzz, I think, that yeah. that, that piece of music. I mean, it's such a lovely piece of music anyway. It is but, fabulous. Um, they're, still, they're still on tour for probably nearly two weeks, week and a half. Yeah. There's not many. There's not many dates that actually have tickets. I'm not actually. I'm not even sure if there are tickets available. But no. if the charlatans are nearby, you should go and see them. Do you yeah. know what? I'm going to spoil a surprise here, Chris. I wasn't going to tell you this. I was going to surprise you, but um, and and it is charlatans related. I'm going to be ticking a box next week that I didn't really know. I want. I needed ticking. Okay. So, my friend and friend of the pod. Uh, and watch this space, listeners. Martin Carr, mm-hmm. ex Boo Radleys, he is supporting the Charlatans. So if you are going to see them, make sure you get there early and see Martin because he's fantastic. Mm. They are playing Liverpool next week, and I am trekking over to Liverpool to see Martin uh, and give him give him a massive hug and uh, enjoy uh, that smile of his. He's a he's a beaut, and. I am going to be on his merch stand. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Oh, are you going to be there with a Sharpie signing everything? <laughs> <laughs> signing all the singles with love, Alex Winters. <laughs> <laughs> Who do you want this to? Who do you want this made out to? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Oh, that's hilarious. For any any parents listening who are my CBBC era, this is random, but I once signed an autograph as Mr. Maker. <laughs> they, they they bombarded me, this this family, for a picture and, and thought I was Mr. Maker and did not give me the chance to say I am not. And then for some reason, when they gave me something to sign, I actually signed it as Mr. Maker. But anyway, wow. so... If you are going to the Liverpool gig next week, the charlatans, the charlatans, please come to the merch stand and um, and make my day because I am going to be selling merch, Martin Carr's merch. Bring your own Mr. Tumble T-shirts and Alex will sign <laughs> them. <laughs> Honestly, I used to I, I used to think that I'd go to gigs all the time and I just thought, I want to be the merch guy. I would love to go on tour with a band, sell the merch. What a job. And what a job. Here you are. I know. Wow. And I'm going to do it for one night only. On the pavement outside with your with your posters. <laughs> well, anything we don't sell inside, got to get rid of. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we've just talked about um, Tim and uh, Tim Burgess, and we need to kind of stop talking about Tim because we will talk about Tim after this episode. So yes, we will. Yes. More exciting news. Hold that thought. Now, haven't, (laughs) haven't we had another live gig as well? Well, well, it seems like years ago, but we did uh, an episode with the lovely James Atkin from EMF, the mighty EMF. Hmm. Yeah. And I, I'd I'd love to be really excited and build this bit up. Hooray! Hooray! Hey. I'm so excited for you, Chris. So so excited about this next bit. Um, but uh, yeah, in that episode, at the end of the episode, James talked about this kind of low key gig that they were going to do at Topmorden in a small yeah. venue, a pub called yeah. Golden Lion in Topmorden. Yes. 
and yeah, tiny tiny venue isn't it tiny yeah, venue tiny venue i mean it's yeah. it's probably never going to happen again this kind of gig no nope. uh, no really. probably and, not and he invited us both that's right <laughs> yeah yes he did and we were both yes, very excited did. about going yes we were yeah yes we were um, and and did we both go did you enjoy the night chris it was absolutely brilliant i loved it loved it and- I had, a, thank you for asking, I had a lovely night at my daughter's dance show and I cried and it was beautiful and wonderful. Well, to be honest, I did I did mention this to Ian and James. I, I gave your apologies and, uh, but also it was lovely because I texted you during and you said, it's fantastic, I'm really enjoying this. And I thought it was just so lovely. It was so lovely because, you know, you could have been that bad dad who goes, oh, I can't believe I'm here. Oh, I'm, I'm watching ballet or something. And, and I should be at EMF in a small venue. But actually, you were, you were a very, very cool dad. And you were like, this is actually really good. So what did I actually play. say? <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember. I'm not going to drag that up. But, you know, you did. You, you, you were very cool about it. Um, I, I yeah I don't have to lie it, it, no. it, it it's been two years since she's been able to do and and it makes my day watching her dance but yeah. judge me all you want a part of me wanted to be in Todmorden at that EMF gig well I did I brought something back I brought something back stick a rock no oh not the uh, rash got that no. rash again no oh. no i brought back an interview with ian and james here it is so i'm here with james and ian from emf and uh yeah it's uh what first one back is uh, oh, yeah. first one this is the first one since since total lockdown yeah this is the first one for two years i think we played in tipperary in 2019 and that was the last gig we played so how have you prepped for this one then what's the what's been the process has it been different to previous tours or i guess in the past we were sort of like oh we know how to do this and we, we would turn up so it's been so long we decided to get together at james's house and and have a rehearsal and we had such a great day just to hang out a bit play through the set and, and fine-tune a few things that, that probably needed fine-tuning yeah. uh, over the last couple of years and, bit, and probably because we were a bit rusty as well and, yeah. and we, we had a great day, right, James? It was fantastic, yeah. It was more a sort of rebonding than a rehearsal, I would say. Um, I mean, it was great playing through the tunes, but just getting the equipment out, dusting off the amps and just having a blast through, I think it did us the world of good. Yeah. And just, you know, for us to remember that we can still do it. Um, yeah. And we are prepared now. Well, I was going to say, because we are in the Golden Lion in uh, Todmorden. And so this is a, a, a warm-up gig, essentially. So you, you're down to London. When's, when's the gig in London? Uh, London is on the 10th of December. Yeah. So this is a warm-up, although I haven't really thought of it as a warm-up. It just seems like a, a standalone gig because it's such an amazing venue and everyone's raves about it. For as long as when I moved up to the north, everyone said you've got to go to this venue in Toddington. It's like legendary, yeah. and even people from London were going, "Oh my God, I've gone up to Toddington. It's mental." Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's been one we've been wanting to do, and this seemed like a perfect opportunity. Yeah, well, it's it's the first time I've been here, and I can't believe I've not been here before because it's 20 minutes on the train from Manchester, and it's basically you to fall out the the train and you're in the pub basically. It's fantastic. So, um, how how did the sound check go? <laughs> it really good. I, I, it's a it's a, a tiny venue, and I think because of that, the sound is really good. It's it's not like one of those huge halls where the sound echoes around and you can't hear anything. It's got a really tight sound. They the people here know exactly what they're doing. They 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 were really great. They knew way around the system and and set us up really well. They are lovely. I mean, just kind of just say everybody up north seems to be friendly and like. They want to look after us and check everything's okay, and they keep like you know, so if you've got everything you need, and and uh, and it just seems like a really good vibe, and 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 then uh, um, and then uh, you know we were just chatting to some of the, the fans out there that you know haven't been here for a while, and it's just a lot of people have just have been like I haven't seen you for ages, but I'm so happy to be here, and and uh, there's a couple down there who met at our Guildhall gig, and they they came in earlier and they bought their five-year-old son. And, so, and, they, and he was like, you know, George, 
um, wouldn't be here if it wasn't thanks to you. And we're like, whoa, that's amazing. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and some other people, there was a car, I just met another girl downstairs who was like on our first uh, Shuba Dip tour. She had one of the lanyards. From the, oh, from the she first. showed me that. She yeah. says, remember this? I was kind of looking a bit blurred. It was blurred. <laughs> 1991. <laughs> really? So, so you're going to you're going to dedicate children to them. Yeah, that was, that was a good idea actually. Um, and so, for a gig this size in a venue of this size, do you approach it in a, a, a different way, or is it just no prisoners, as as normal? Um, that's a tricky one. I think we always approach gigs the same way whatever it is it always seems like we're going out to battle um, yeah honestly it does and having that mentality of just throwing yourself at the audience not like physically but you know just you know projecting yourself and just trying to grab them and make that connection um i think it's easier in a smaller place and obviously you know if you've got right on top of every, everyone and uh yeah i think i think it's gonna be quite easy tonight i'm not too nervous about tonight i've got a bit of anxiety but i'm not nervous i think it's gonna be great yeah, a bit of anxiety is nice, yeah. isn't it? Because you yeah, want to be, it, it makes, you know, it's because we can, because it's always special, you know, like it was, get a little bit like, you know, is it? Yeah, well, I, I, that that phrase taking no, taking no prisoners just popped into my head but obviously there was some kind of subconscious thought yeah, there but, yeah, and then you like saying going into battle yeah well you want to give people a, a really good night and put some effort into it and show people your passion and your love for it and you know that's what people want I think yeah. we could play it cool but I don't know too old to play cool these days, aren't we? Yeah. No. It's just like, let's fucking go and have a good time and just you're still, love it. You're st- <laughs> Brilliant. James, you're still the coolest oh, person in the universe. And just one last question before you go and get get ready, get your makeup on. Um, plans for 2022, have you got anything lined up? There, anything are, up? Some, there are dates coming in, um, festivals, we're kind of quite choosy, we don't go out and play that often, we like to do things that are interesting to us. Um, and special so we have got big plans we've got some very big plans we're hoping to get some new material out there and obviously gigs to support the new material yeah. and a couple of good festivals still like to do some travel abroad I don't know how that's looking for next year yeah if it's been on hold we have some interesting dates that obviously got cancelled when the first lockdown happened so I'd like to get back out and do a few things I think it's gonna be a good year Brilliant. It's been like, you know, it's been a tough two, three years, so it's going to be great to get back out there. A bit of normality, maybe. Yeah, but who needs normality, yeah? Exactly. Yes. Well, thank you, James and Ian. That was, that was absolutely thanks, wonderful. Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh, that was brilliant. Ah, you beauties. That was, that was really good of them to uh, take a few minutes out to chat as well. Hmm. And how did the gig because that was obviously uh before the gig how did it go it went off it, it was great it was really good um yeah loads of really die hard emf fans and also i get the impression that a lot of the people who were there were just die hard music fans who just went to everything that was on at the golden lion and if you really? haven't been to the yeah if you haven't as i mentioned in that interview if you haven't been to the golden lion before it's about 20 minutes train journey from uh, manchester victoria station uh, and as again as i said you can it's fall, only 20 minutes 20 minutes you fall out the train and you're in the pub it's ridiculously close it's so it's so fantastic and <laughs> Alex's face. What time did they come? What time did they come on stage? They came on about it was just after ten o'clock. Oh, oh, his face. Oh, mm. his little face. Um, yeah. So it was around just after ten o'clock. Um, but yeah, it was it was great. But the the stage, you know, it had a bookcase on the stage. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, it's hardly a stage, isn't it? Isn't it like a foot just, high or something? Yeah, it's about a foot high, and <laughs> I was literally just there. I just had to have my wide angle lens, and basically James was right in front of me. Um, but um, yeah, it was knockout, and and yeah, the the place was jumping. So it, did did everyone get into it? Did all yeah. you know? Yeah, absolutely. 
absolutely. It's be- I mean, and they they played um, unbelievable very early on. I mean, they they played that about seven tunes in. Okay, um, which was surprising. But, yeah, but that's I think good. that's good though. No, I like that. I like that, and also um, I think they they realised that they had a captive audience and that people weren't just waiting to hear unbelievable they were yeah. waiting to hear the band you know and um just Good enjoy on, the man. whole thing so because i am i asked that because i i am enjoying as i grow older and at the age of 44 and apparently going to more gigs than ever i'm enjoying watching my peers and how they act at gigs because it's so funny now because, well, you've been to many gigs with me. If I want to dance, I'll dance. I have no whatever. I, I just love it. Talent for dancing? No talent for dancing <laughs> at all. And I really don't care. You have moment. actually got some moves. I don't. And um, it is funny to me watching, though, people thinking, am I too old for this? Should I be doing this? Oh, yeah. So it does make... Ah, you say that, and but I'm all right with, with the people that don't and there are you know our peers who don't as well but it is funny seeing that seeing that sort of split and seeing that sort of uh, our age group now going cool we're in our 40s now what do what is the etiquette at a gig yeah but it was uh they they were loving it at the charlatans and it sounds like they were loving it at, at emf too so what uh, I've just said I'm off to see I suppose yeah I'm off to see the Shartans again next week but um, uh, go and see Martin so I'm excited about that I've also got um, I've got two nights out can you imagine in a row Chris wow Wednesday is Martin and the Charlatans right. Tuesday one of my favourite venues the Albert Hall in Manchester it's Little Sims oh it's coming up right okay Yes. Oh, yeah. Now, now that'll be interesting to see how this middle-aged white man acts at a little Sims gig. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's, I just don't know. Am I going to lose my head? Am I going to just get down there with the kids and get dancing? I just don't know. I might get thrown out, arrested, all of the above, to be honest, Chris. Just be yourself. In which case you probably will get thrown out and arrested. <laughs> <laughs> exactly bring on little sims yeah. and if you don't know little sims go and listen she is just incredible yeah, and one of my favorite good. albums of the year yeah. so we've got a guest we've got a guest now yeah, we I, have i'm i'm so chuffed about this guest um because it's just really interesting fella and i've known him for <laughs> Um, for a little while, haven't you? Yeah, about 20, 23 years, basically. 23 yeah. years. 23 years. Yeah, so it's my father-in-law. It's Mr. Bum, Howard bum, Murray. Bum, 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 bum. Howard Murray. Tell tell us a, a, a bit about, or not ask the listeners, tell tell the listeners a little bit, just a little bit, because we talk, he explains quite a bit. But tell us why we've got your father-in-law on. Well, he's been playing music professionally since 1959 and he's a cracking player a really really superb sax player and um i've had the the pleasure of um sitting in playing playing saxophone in in his band um two or three times no more than that more than that um but every time i, I play with him it's it's you know you learn from somebody who's so good um yeah he's just knockout um really and yeah we 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 have a we have a great chat about his influences and the the music that he loved when he was when he was growing up and and learning about music and um yeah and and also it's about a, a time when music was really changing, when jazz was being overtaken by rock and roll. Um, mm-hmm. So the, the start, end of the fifties, start of the sixties. So, um, and it's not something that we've really talked about. We talked about it a little bit in um, Dennis Lawson's 
episode when we talked about yeah. you know kind of the birth of the teenager and that kind of thing but um howard's a little bit older than than, than dennis and um kind of was was there you know as a as a performing musician at that at that time as well so uh, we get that kind of perspective um and it's fun and listening back when i was editing it it was it was just funny it's just really funny really, it just i really really enjoyed this and i think um this is important to our podcast um that it's not just people you may have heard of you know some of our most enjoyable chats have been with uh, with people that you perhaps haven't you know like sophie williams and uh, anna doble and now howard murray i you well you know i just love speaking to people <clears throat> i would sit on a bus or a tram all day and just chat to people i genuinely love it and so only knowing him as your father-in-law and nothing else was just perfect for me because I just had question after question after question. And I'm sorry if the edit was a nightmare, but it was just so interesting. And I just love hearing people's experiences and uh, specifically, you know, their experiences with music and, and hearing their knowledge and sharing that knowledge. So I just, I really, really enjoyed this chat. And I, I think you're all going to, uh, love it too and and soon you'll be you'll be begging howard to come and play at your weddings birthdays bar mitzvahs dare i say it funerals um <laughs> so without further ado chris i think you should introduce the man himself go on he's howard murray yes well done you did well he'd be so proud of you you're his favorite son-in-law <laughs> And welcome to this episode of Gig Stories podcast with me, Chris. And me, Alex. This is an exciting one, isn't it, Chris? Yeah. We are sat around a table together. Can you believe it? Yeah, there's no... Well, there are computer screens around. But, um, <laughs> but we are in my dining room. We're in the parlour. Is it parlour or a dining Used room? Used to be parlour. Yeah. Um, with, with my father-in-law. Um, Howard Murray, who has oh, been fair. playing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you forget? Yeah. You tried to forget. The look on Howard's face there when he thought, who? <laughs> father-in-law? Chris's behind. father-in-law's here. Oh yeah, of course I am. I've not met him. But this is, this is great though, because it sounds like utter nepotism. But actually, I think it's just lucky chance. Um Welcome, Howard. Thank you. And uh, Howard is a, a, a Salford lad, but has... Swinton. So, oh, Swin Swinton. 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 Yeah. Now, Swinton is in Salford, though, isn't it? No, in the city it's, of Salford? No, it's, an, it's an explorator, it's, but it's, it's all part of the um, great um, metropolitan district. Of Salford. Right. The whole lot. There's, yeah. there's so many boroughs in Manchester. It, yeah. it blows my mind. It's not like any yeah. other uh, any other place. The city used to be in Lancashire. Oh my gosh! Well, I, I'm, I'm I'm new to here, so oh, that's, right. that's my excuse. Yeah, I'm new to here. But as, as a result, Lancashire cricket ground is not in Lancashire. No, it's not, is it? No. <laughs> Which is, but it but used to be. That's a, that's another podcast. We're, we're, that's a cricketing <laughs> podcast with Greg James and uh, Jimmy Anderson. That, but we are we're excited to have you with us, Howard, um, because you have spent most of your life. And I, I don't want to reveal your age. If you'd like to say I'm your 80, age, eighty-two. Oh, there we go. Uh, that's right, eighty-two. Um, playing, uh, playing various instruments, mm -hmm. mainly reeds, mainly reed instruments. And you have a plethora of experience <laughs> of live music. Is that right, Howard? Well, <laughs> uh, twenty nineteen would have been the sixtieth anniversary of that photograph. So Howard is showing us a, a photograph and you have got a fabulous head of hair. Yes. <laughs> now, it, for, for our listeners, explain this photograph that Chris and I are looking at, Howard. 
Well, it was a put together band on New Year's Eve uh, with two people I already knew and I think another two I didn't know completely, unrehearsed, didn't know what to expect. And when would they, what year would this Ni have been? 1959. So 1959 and we've got, we've got a guitar, you're playing clarinet, is yeah. that uh, correct? We've got a trombone, a drummer and uh, a pianist. And this was, this was the first time you'd played in a band and it was for New Year's Eve? In, in public, yeah. I'd played with not together bands with, for hobbies, but for the first time I actually got a job. I was an apprentice television engineer at the time oh, and right. I got nearly a week's wages for doing that. For doing that one gig, yeah. Well, we've got the uh, the venue, so it's the the T T A Barracks Hall, so the Territorial Army Barracks Hall in Wally Range, yeah. in Manchester. So on guitar we had Alan Yates, Malcolm Ferrari on drums. What Mike, a name, Malcolm Ferrari. Yeah. And what also a name, Mike Medina Ooh. on piano. Then on trombone we've got Howard Burrows, and on clarinet Mr. Howard Murray. So that mm -hmm. was New Year's Eve, nineteen fifty-nine. Yeah. Wow. Seeing in 1960. Yeah. You were seeing out the 50s yes. and bringing yeah. in the 60s with that. So let, I want to build up to there then, Howard. Um, let's go back because you're a multi instrumentalist. Yeah. You ju just, just tell me, you say read, and that's just too humble for me. I want to be more uh, concise. What? what instruments do you play? Clarinet. Yeah. And the whole family of saxophones. Right. Alto, a soprano, alto, tenor, baritone. Okay, and and how did how did that come about in the in the forties? Because you you were a little boy growing up in the forties. Born in thirty nine, just after Hitler started getting busy. Yeah. <laughs> December thirty nine. And was can you remember much of those oh. first six years of your oh, life? Oh yeah, very clearly. Well, but, certainly by the time I got to school. Right. Okay. Um, I remember my brother being born. He was three years young. He is three years younger than I am. So I must have been three, and I clearly remember him being being born. Was well, because I, I I don't want to sort of get into the war and how it was for you. More, I'd like to ask the question: Was music an important distraction? Very to much you? so, because my mother was a professional pianist. Oh, your mum was a professional yeah. pianist. Well, semi-professional, should yeah. say. Yeah. She played for dances and weddings and the like, so I was exposed to music very early on. So what what would she have what would she have been playing? Piano. Okay, but what yeah. kind of music Dance, would you have, would what, you have heard? Ballroom dancing type. Ballroom dancing. What they call Strictly now. <laughs> yeah, Strictly. Kind and of do you know dancing. why it's called Strictly? Because no. uh, the main d dance band of the time called it Strict Tempo da Dancing. That's strict tempo dancing, yeah. and that's why it's that's why that's it became strict. So they couldn't mess about with the tempo because that would screw up the dancers. Yes. They would be. Mm. Oh, obviously, I can remember his name at the moment, but uh, his well, signature tune was "You're Dancing on My Heart." I can remember that. Can't think of his name. Yeah. And so, it, is is the first music you remember in your life? You hearing your mum play at home? Well, radio. Radio was very popular. No yeah. TV, of course. Yeah. So, uh, oh, yeah, there's plenty of music in the house. So what, what venues was, well, Nan played, what, your, your mum, where was she where was They she were the church halls when, when there was a wedding and then they all went into the church hall for the reception. She'd play for those. Yeah. Or people who held once a week dance night. Yeah. In this, probably in the same places. And would they, would they always be, this is such a, uh, this may come across really ignorant and I, I don't mean that at all. Would Were there a lot of sort of, um, event bands. Oh yes, yes. Uh, at, that that yeah. sort of local that would be doing the rounds and that were paid for it. Oh as well. yes, indeed, semi-pro dance bands. A lot of but fun. would there have been many featuring women? Possibly on piano. It's always the thing that uh, girls were taught the piano and, and boys might have been taught a, a woodwind of some sort. Right. But yeah, I, w I would have thought that 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 would have been quite rare in terms of playing. Professional. Yeah. Good, good in point. the events of these <laughs> these gigs, as we now call them, uh, the drummer used to turn up with his kit on a handcart. 
<laughs> really? Well, nobody had a car. I mean, we're talking about 20s or 30s, you know. Yeah. Do you know what? Talk about practicalities. Yeah, that's never crossed my mind. How did the drummer get his kit around and he would just pull it around on a car? Well, I know a friend, friend of Howard's, who you've known since the 50s, yeah. uh, Mo Green, yeah. drummer. Well, you, you tell the story because well, I've heard it. By the time I got to know him, we'd already got cars. So what what he did before a car, I don't know. Did he? He, he, oh, he pushed. Made, he pushed his oh. drum kit in a pram. Oh, that was it. To gigs, brilliant. Yeah. yeah so he had this. Um, oh, I forgot. It, it was known as the Rolls Royce of, of prams. Oh, a really sturdy. Gold, Silver Cross. Silver Cross. That's oh, the, the Silver Cross pram. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And so he said that the. Um, the bass drum fitted absolutely perfectly where the baby should be. Yeah. And then he could get his cymbals down the sides. Yeah. And then he could get the snare underneath. <laughs> and I think he maybe only had one tom as well. Yeah. And so he managed to get take a skeleton kit out. Yeah, know. just a skeleton kit. And um, but he would fit it all in the, the pram. So I've taken a portrait of him with a drum kit in a pram. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. But yeah, transport. So you must have had. Before, what what did you do before you had a car, or were you? Oh, I had a, 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 a scooter, I can't think. I don't know what type of, Not the best, but the other one. The kind of Lambretta. Lambretta. All oh, right, okay. And uh, <laughs> one day I'd had some trouble with the engine, and I'd left the panel off one side, and we went out to the bike. Now, you've got to believe this, I had a saxophone case between my knees on the, on the platform, yeah. Cla <laughs> clarinet on, under my foot and my left foot yeah. on, the, on the platform, and on the back I had a trombone player, <laughs> with, a, with a trombone under one arm and a bag of mutes under the other. <laughs> I haven't finished. <laughs> on the back right was an amplifier and a speaker. How did they even move? <laughs> no. Anyway, I'd, very slowly. On this occasion, uh, I, I'd forgotten. To, I, I'd deliberately left the panel off, and it, somehow a spark plug just blew out. It was a hell of a bang! No. That night, Howard the trombonist had forgotten to bring his bag of mutes, and he had his trombone under his left arm, where it would normally have been under his right arm, yes. and the plug would have gone right through the trombone if it had been there. <laughs> 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 he, and couldn't find it anywhere, so I chugged it, still moving, chugged it to right into a petrol station, boom, 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 to a petrol station, bought a spark plug, screwed it in, kicked it up and drove off again. That is wow. absolutely brilliant. That's, that's quite different to how they get around for gigs these oh, days. Yeah. Now, but back then, it was, um, you, you know, music was... Uh, was really important to the working classes and I remember my dad telling me he's my dad would be a couple of years older than you he'd be 80 84 now and he played in the skiffle band and he grew oh, up later. Yeah. he grew up in the docks uh, my father Cardiff. spent his life on the docks oh really yeah and and we get to know each other we'll be, be related in a minute <laughs> oh yeah that, that that would be very Celtic, that wouldn't it? Would yeah. be it. That would be very difficult. And he would always, you know, tell me about about his music and and how it was an outlet. What instruments were they hard to get hold of, and were no, they expensive? No, no. Well, I know my pa paid for my first clarinet, and it seemed a lot of money at the time. It was a second hand, a used one, twenty one pounds, but that was three weeks' wages. Mm. Wowzers! So it cost him a lot. He you know, invested in my future. You know. yeah. And so that so they to play a musical instrument back then from you know from the working classes it, it did require a lot of sacrifice. Indeed, uh, but then instruments were handed down. Oh, okay. And of, of course. course, if you were a brass player and joined a brass band, very often you would get an instrument that belonged to the band. Right, Which made it made life easier. I was never in brass bands playing reeds, but it made life a bit easier than you think it was. So, what was your what was your sort of musical journey then? Because because we're in sort of brass band countries, so yeah. you, you avoided that in school. Well, did you, you don't did... play. They don't have clarinets in in brass bands. It's all it's all brass. Ah, right. Of yeah. course, of course. Yeah. So, what made you choose reeds then? What was well, what, where were the go back the before decision? that? At the age of eight, we had a sudden 
test in the class at school, a music test, mm. unwarned, we were, we were prepared, and it had two things in it. Once you played the scale on the piano, and we knew tonic so far. Yeah. You know tonic so far. Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti. Yes, right? yes. We knew that. And so, so she played a scale and she said, that, right, this is do. Played it. And then she'd play another note. We had to guess what, identify it. And by, it. by saying re, me, or, me, or, or whatever radio. it was. Yeah. And oh, I, wow. went through, I went through this easy peasy. I didn't know I'd got an ear like I clearly have. And then she had a rhythm test with a rule, and she went, What tune was that? She said, I said, Jingle Bells. So I passed. Yeah, so, that is so funny. That led on to, to record the lessons. That, what she was doing, this, I say she, it was about that at that stage. And what he was doing was sorting out people who might be suitable to, have to form a recorder class. Yeah. So perhaps. Hounds for us went into it, and I really took to it. I played in school concerts on recorder. And do you do you think that do you think that came from your mum and from oh, from you hearing the musical you aspect know, came from music? Your mother, yeah. Okay. Anyway, as we get to up towards eleven plus, which you had to take in those days to get to grammar school, I'd clearly taken to it. And the music teacher said to my father, "Oh, my father must have asked." What follows? What, what main instrument would follow a uh, recorder? The blobs, without a doubt, say the clarinet. It's d directly related. Same, you know, same. Everything going on. Mm. So they said, right, well, if you pass your eleven plus, plus, we'll buy you a clarinet. So right. I did. But they said, well, we're going to buy you one anyway. <laughs> 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 they told you that after you passed. Afterwards, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. When can you remember when you fell in love with? Uh, with music and with instruments? I can't remember ever not being able to play. Really? Well, I mean, it's eight. Uh, yeah. You've been playing all your life. I've been playing uh, right through. So I can't, I can't now remember what it's like to be unable to play an instrument. And so uh, back then, so now, for example, my my son plays the drums and he wants to play in a, you know, in a band and, well, and get him that be his yeah. job. Back then, was it realistic for a, a young lad or a young lady to want to to be a professional musician, or was it was that supposed to just be a hobby? And yes, I focus? think at that stage for me it was an interest, and and it, my mother said I never had to, I was never forced to practice. I just used to go in the bedroom and play. She, not, not a case of come do you practice I never, she never had to tell me that it right. was a major interest yeah. so uh, I went through school playing in school orchestra and a bit of a band in the school yeah. not really thinking I would uh, do it for a, for, for a living yeah. and of course after I was about, I'd be about 19 and I bumped into this Howard on the, on the picture Howard Burroughs, Burroughs uh, in Piccadilly bus station which uh, he was going one way and I was going another. I'd known him for for some time. He said, "Are you doing anything New Year's Eve?" I said, "No, I'm not." He said, "Right, bring your clarinet." And, and it was that that gig in that picture, New Year's Eve. What, can you remember what music you were playing? On that well, a, a mixture of dance music and probably Dixieland jazz. Dixieland yeah. jazz. Okay. But really, I was learning it. I mean, I learned my profession on the stage while we we're doing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You go up there and do it, and you don't do it very well. And next time you're a little bit better. Yeah. And then you you get to the stage where you wonder what tunes you can play next because they're bringing stuff up you don't know. Then you realise you you're going to have to know it until you learn it, and it just unravels slowly. You don't know you you don't, don't realise it's happening. It's just so that, experience. So that gig then was really quite seminal for you, it was really quite important oh, for you. Oh, indeed, yes. I didn't know what I was going to play when I got, until I got there. Oh, on that night, you didn't even no, know what you were going to play? No, and in fact, when you're playing one tune, you don't know what you're going to be playing next, because the band leader calls something out, and... Yeah. The, I, I see, I don't, I don't understand yeah. that. I, I just, <laughs> that just blows my mind. Well, but the that repertoire was, is, is su such an important thing, it's almost as important as learning to play the instrument oh, itself yeah. Yeah. because then you have got this 
jukebox essentially yeah. in, within yeah. yourself yeah, to be able to go right. We're going to do this, and we're going to do it in this key. And but what if he what if he called out on that first gig then that night? What if he called out a song that you didn't know? Then I would have said, "Oh, I don't know that." Oh, you would have. You were allowed yeah. to. Oh yes, but later in life, when I've come to grips with the construction of tunes, I say I don't know it, but play it. Otherwise, I'll never know it. And then I could unravel from the way the tune was constructed. How to, what was coming up next? Because really? they're much of a muchness. Some of these. Tunes. And I suppose with Dixieland as well, there's an element of certainly with what the clarinet is doing. The clarinet yeah. is generally the augmenting death whatever. Th so you're you're playing death, around the melody. Yeah, it's the death count, yeah. Yeah, yeah, rather than actually yeah. playing the tune. Yeah. Um, so so there is a kind of in there. Oh, um, well, indeed. If you don't know the tune, you probably know the chord sequence, for example. Later. Yeah. But at that stage, I didn't know the chords were involved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was just ears, but I gradually we get became became aware that the chord system has a construction and yeah. a structure. So that was your first gig. What do you remember the first gig that you actually went to as a as a punter to go and see? Oh no, went to so many. So many. Um, when did you start going to going to them? Was it before this New Year's Eve gig, or no, was it in the sixties? So in the sixties, once I got you started, into the business, right. I started going around listening to bands. Yeah. Right. So what kind of bands would you have been going to see then? Manchester, I mean, in Britain, in in general, in general. In general, with uh, New Orleans revival jazz, it yeah. was a massive revival in the forties, and I got it. it was still going. <laughs> Do you know I killed it? No. The Beatles. <laughs> 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 who 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 are they? What ever happened yeah, to them? Exactly. Eh? Exactly. Yeah. I've I've got to say, listener, that as as Chris and I look across the table towards Howard. Sat right behind him above his head is a massive Beatles poster. Oh, Hard day's night. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the 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 cabin was initially a lunchtime jazz gig with orange juice only, unlicensed. No, yeah, and it was yeah. full. It was packed, absolutely packed, with people drinking coffee on, on orange juice and, and listening to to the jazz band. I'm on a the main band was a band that still it still exists in name, the Mississippi Jazz Band. Yes, yeah, and it's still around in name. All the, the, the originals have gone now. You did you ever go to the cavern? Once or twice, yeah. Did you? Oh yeah. Well, hang. Did you see the Beatles at the cavern? No, no, no. Oh. No, but I can tell you how they got in. Go, oh, please do, please do. <laughs> well, at the interval, it went quiet. All the the band had gone away to get some. Drink, go out, go out, and nothing happened. And somebody from the Beatles asked if next week they could come in. I don't think they were called the Beatles in those days. The Silver Beatles, something like that. Yeah, oh, and well, the Quarrymen as well. No, that was early still. Yeah. I think they were in um, Germany as the Quarrymen. Right. Okay. Uh, so they came in and played an interval, and then in the end they were booked to play the interval. They were booked to play the interval. Yes. <laughs> Pay, in other words, on on pay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it changed around, and the band was put in in the middle, and the Beatles on either side. Right. And then it went well, even worse. They got rid of the band. Yeah. They did, you know, the trap band. Yeah. So. That's, and that was what, how it grew. So live, then you were going to see, you were going to see the bands uh, as you were, and then you say the Beatles put an end to that. Were the, the Beatles themselves? Uh, Obviously, would uh, would tell people that their influence was, you know, from essentially the the black rock and roll musicians. Yeah, the blues. You know, the, exactly the blues and that. Yeah. Were you ever in in Britain and in the Northwest here? Were you ever fortunate enough to experience that firsthand with those musicians, or or actually was it was it just a step straight from those bands to well, the Beatles? Well, traditional jazz is essentially the blues anyway. Yeah. It grew out of the blues. Uh, but there's, at the time, there were very few, if any, black musicians in Britain. Right, OK. Whereas in okay. New Orleans, yeah. it was mixed. Yeah. And at some stage in New Orleans, despite segregation, they did get together. Yeah. Uh, but when, when did you start noticing a difference in the music? When you start, when did you start hearing a difference and thinking, "Hang on, something's changing here"? Do you mean uh, uh, 
the arrival of, of rock. Yeah. Well, yeah, we, we were yeah. generally, if you're out on a jazz gig, the, the rockers were on another one, so you didn't come, come across them. Cabaret t tended to bring it together. I've been on cab when I did, I did lots of cabaret, and you would then be on the bill with a rock group. And that's that's really when you when you got to know, but they were all paid massively higher than we were, you know. Yeah. Really, really, what, why is that? Well, there were names. Um, oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I've never doubled with the Beatles, but uh, that trombonist that on that picture, he he played at the Ritz when the Beatles were on the on this show. They'd be top of the bill, I imagine. Mm. And yeah. he, he, he he said he heard John, the, the guy that was murdered. John Lennon. See his shout from the from the dressing room. Where's my shirt? <laughs> <laughs> and Doddy eventually captured that as a as a, 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 a catchphrase. Where's my shirt? That's when we bumped into them, but we didn't perform with them. Yeah. And did you always, did you then always just stay with the the sort of uh, your genre of music? Or oh yes, did you, yeah. Did, so, did I mean, you branch out? It, or? Well, I, I preferred um, a bit later period, what they call the, the West Coast period of much more smooth academic jazz. But nobody played it when I when I was in mid teens. Nobody played it in, in England, so you, you got to play what you got to play. And was that kind of you know, kind of Mulligan, Jerry Mulligan, Bob Lee, Brook, Lee yeah. And yeah. Stan Getz, would he class him? I as, think no, as Stan. West Coast? No, he wasn't. He might have been West Coast. Yeah, he came out in the sixties. Yeah, but, Chet Baker oh, and he was a king. Stan Getz was a king. Yeah. Without a doubt, Chet Baker was West Coast. Yeah. yeah. Who were your earlier influences musically? Right. Who, the clarinet in London called uh, Sid Phillips. Okay. And he had a small band which was so well arranged that it sounded like a big band. Really? Yeah. He wow. had um, perhaps seven or eight people in it. It was ages before I realised that this wasn't a big band. It was just so well written. Were, were you hearing him on, on, on the radio? On the radio, yeah. were you? Yeah. And you were assuming, oh, this is a big band. Yeah. Mm. But they were just filling the gaps so well. So everything was very carefully orchestrated yeah and then it ju just made a big sound out there. Sid Phillips mm. and did he record a lot oh yeah you'll find him on there you see right he was my absolute hero at the time I remember I moved well, once I started listening to Voice of America and finding there was a station called the Jazz Hour right Wh Willis Conover Jazz Hour and I, I'm radio I'm, I'm an electronics engineer as well you see you know, so that's the, where the two have gone parallel. That was your that was your day yeah, job. Yeah. Was it? Started off in TV and went into communications, uh, and I used to listen on shortwave uh, to this jazz hour and really took a liking to jazz. And who were the who were the names that you were listening to from across the pond? The names the, 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 the West Coast yeah, guys. Yeah. Well, it, the whole um, whole spectrum of jazz. Yeah. Represented. Well, it was two hours actually. It was the jazz hour followed by the big band hour. So right. you just got two hours of reception was a bit grim sometimes on show. Yeah. Who, who were your favourite big band artists? Oh, well, there were so many of them. I mean, Ellington, Basie. Um, if you don't use the names, they go. But they, they must have had acres, acres and acres of of bands in America. They call them territorial bands because they used to travel all over the place. Yeah. And uh, one of the bands, I think, was Goodman. They they went a full year without missing a night. That's just the many Goodman Orchestra. I think yes, one of that. Either, either Goodman or somebody at that level. That's yeah. just crazy. Before before I ask you about travelling with with gigs and where you went and where you've been, I just want to get. I picked up on something earlier, and it was with regards to gig, the mm. word gig. Oh, yeah. And you said gig, I yeah. should call it now. Yeah. It was not called a gig No, back it's, then? it's inside. The, it was for the musicians, but it was inside the last 10 years that the young folk picked up this word. They even talk about going to work as going to a gig. Yeah. And in fact, mm. musicians in New Orleans 
generally the black ones, didn't get paid, they just played for the hell of playing. And yeah. if they ever got a paid job with a fee for each of the musicians, they thought it was wonderful, it's God is good. And that's how gig came about. God is good. Oh, so that's the story. Gig. Yeah. That, that's the story. I absolutely love that. And I, I suppose we should have known that, seeing as it's, we've only got four words in the name of our podcast, and we don't know what one of them means. Yeah, yeah that's true. Really. Well, well, we do now. I, I, I well, now. You're on the Gig Stories podcast. You're so on the, right. the word gig in our name. The God is Good Stories podcast. I think that changes this podcast slightly, doesn't it? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm as well suited. That gives, suited. Me, that gives me a bit of PTSD. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're going to be all right, mate. <laughs> well, people say, um, oh, I'm, I've got a gig, I'm putting a window frame in. The, the, the words have been totally hijacked. Ah, yeah. uh, right. So, so back then, you musicians performing, you had a gig. Yes. What would, us as punters, what would we call it? Depends. It could be a concert or... Um, a show recital yeah. <laughs> right can yeah. you can you remember I'm sort of just jumped up back here but ju- just wondering do you remember the first concert or, or whatever you want to call it that your your parents or your mum or that took you yeah, to yeah very clearly oh yeah, right what was yeah. it well, it was a free trade hall in those days it was a big theatre yes it's something else now and they the Halley Orchestra, yeah. which was originally known as as Mr. Halley's Band, right? Was it? <laughs> yeah. They held what they called industrial concerts. That were concerts in the middle of the day at low ticket price, so that the less well off could come and hear the orchestra sing. Was it called Play. that because it was people who worked in industry? I imagine who would so. Go, I right. never got the explanation, but I well. I guessed it was um, to get to people who could not normally afford the ticket. At, at, yeah. On the, on, the, on the night, and it was it was um, the Halley. Yeah. And we went to three of those, and uh, one of them, it was while oh, the composer that wrote the Fire Dance. Stravinsky. No, I've got the wrong. No, oh, that's Firebird. Yeah. Right. Anyway, it, it was conducted. With his, I think his Hungarian composer was still alive. Yeah. And he was invited to conduct. For the whole concert, industrial concert, mm-hmm. and in the middle of it is, a, I think it's called the Nietzsche's Dance, or one of the pieces in it, uh, calls for a saxophone, and saxophones were unheard of in orchestras. Yeah, in orchestras. Okay, yeah. But today you look at the orchestra, and the clarinet's got a saxophone to his side, but in those, so they had to hire, a bro- bro- bring a bloke in to play this particular dance well he didn't sit there and wait for it to come up he, 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 when it, he sat he was off after, off the scene until it came round so he came striding in with his saxophone in hand and of course <laughs> it, it was just unheard of to see a saxophone with the Halley Orchestra and all the students went oh, sax- saxophone <laughs> they all chanted it because it was outrageous to see the saxophone. That is Cause it, brilliant. Because lots of music students were in there. You know? Yeah. So, so that that was quite a that would have been quite a rock and roll thing then. Sort oh, of thing. I mean, yeah. You know, having it outrageous. Having the saxophone. And it was Johnny Roadhouse they brought in. Right. Oh, was it really? Yeah. yeah. What's so, the so, Johnny Roadhouse? Yeah. yeah. So Johnny, you you know where Johnny Roadhouse is on Oxford Road. So jo- Johnny Roadhouse for for listeners is a. It, is a very famous music shop oh, yes, in, yeah. in Manchester. Yeah. But Johnny Roadhouse himself he was, a, it, yeah. was a very famous musician, wasn't yeah. he? You yeah, want to get his book called the Sax of Gold. Was it? <laughs> sax yeah, of I like gold. that, Sax of Gold. Yeah. So it was saxophone that Johnny was known for playing, oh, yes, was it? Yeah. Yeah. All over the country. Yeah. Yeah. So, so can we just agree then, gentlemen, that Saxophonists are show offs. Is that <laughs> oh, musicians are show offs. Oh, no, no, just, yeah. just saxophonists. Yeah. Well, kind of, kind of. <laughs> oh, of course they are, yeah. So, so where, did, um, where did your playing take you? Did you stay in the Northwest or have you travelled all over? I've played all over Europe. All, all, all over Europe? Oh, all over Europe, yes. Biggest jazz festival, Dresden, uh, Berghaus. I played in. Uh, Denmark, 
We went up to Denmark with three gigs to do, and it's so far, you can't fly, you've got to take a load of gear. And it's so far, you have to have an overnight stay on the German but Danish border, yeah. and then set off again. Yeah. And when we get to Denmark, our house. Yeah, yeah. And of course you know, don't you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we got there, one had closed down, one had burned down. <laughs> 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 so, you, know, had, you had one gig. One gig, because well, that doesn't cover the cost. Then. <laughs> no. Oh um, and these gigs, when you were travelling, what form did this take? What, which band well, was this? Where did you, what did well, you settle into? Most recently, it was a band called the. Uh, my memory's gone. The Old Green River, which is the name of a bourbon whiskey or a, a rye whiskey in America. Right. So we, we ran need to pinch that name. And he has a bus, a band bus, so he's had a series of them. Now, I don't, I don't mean to be rude, Harold, but you said more recently. When, does, when do you mean by more recently? In the last 15 years or so. So you've still been playing in the last 15 years? I, I played up until just before I should have had my 60th uh, anniversary of the gig and I was ill. And then after that, COVID broke out, and I've not done a gig since. That is incredible. Yeah, yeah. So in 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 the early days when you started, was it in the sixties that yeah. you started touring? Yeah. Oh no, I, traveling rather than touring. Traveling to outlying towns. Right. Okay. But the touring came take us down, would take us right down to Cornwall to big jazz festivals there, or onto into Europe, mm. Holland. And again, was that with that? Uh, this is with the, in the last 20, 17 to 20 years. Yeah. But I know Oktoberfest was a big thing. Oh, we had thing for, yeah. for I you. did. Oh, in Germany? A, yes, in Munich. Uh, that was a usually uh, 14 day, 12 to 14 day festival playing in an enormous beer garden called Waldbeerschaft. It sounds it's like it. absolute carnage. <laughs> was it? Was no. it carnage? No, was it no. well behaved? No, extremely well behaved. I would tell the truth. No, it was. <laughs> there was there was one incident that happened fairly recently with somebody who be not won't be named. Who Chris. Try, no, nobody. No, no, be. <laughs> trashed a hotel on the Isle of Butte. Set a hotel room, but we disowned them for that. No, <laughs> no, no very well behaved. They're all families. The. Uh, no, I'm just thinking though, beer you, garden, you you've know. got a, a bunch of jazz musicians for 14 days on the trot playing in a beer garden. Yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. I mean, that's free just beer. a recipe. And free beer. That's, that's why I was saying carnage. You've got an absolute no, recipe no. for disaster there. I, I couldn't blow a raspberry, never mind a, a note out of a saxophone. <laughs> well, how, how, did you, how did you juggle a, a full-time job with, with that well, musicianship? The, the travelling... Um, I was self-employed as an engineer, so I could slot things in as a, I had a, my own repair business at home, so I, that made it very flexible. Right. But it clashed with the job when I was an, an employee, it definitely clashed. With, um, with going to Munich, how many years did you do that for? From 88 to, no, 84 to 89 or, or 90. Right. So I used to know my way to Munich without a map. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Because that was all driving as well. Of course, yeah. you've oh, got yeah, all the instruments yeah. and yeah. and how big was the band that you were going across with? Same sort of seven Same. piece thing. You know. Yeah. So, but on that particular one, we all made our own way there. But with this old Green River band that we travelled on mass. Yeah. I was saying making your own way. That's a uh, that's tempting fate, isn't it? Did you ever have someone not turn up and you have to play without them? No, but we had a guy who didn't turn up one morning after we'd played the night before. <laughs> <laughs> he, he drowned himself with a German lady. So fortunately, we had a visitor, <laughs> visitor with us who was something of a drummer. He wasn't a brilliant drummer, but he, he was capable. Oh, it just had to be the drummer, didn't it? Uh, yeah. Gosh, always the drummer, always the drummer. Yeah. So we just want to ask you a, a, a few questions now. And I, I suppose they're sort of supposed to be quicker questions, but as as it comes, as it comes. What's your? Do you have a favourite venue? Do you have a favourite venue that you've played at over the years? And it can be anywhere. I mean, you've told us you've travelled all over. The, place. the uh, Crescent City Brewery, which is a big restaurant in in New Orleans. 
So you've actually played in New Orleans? Yes. Yeah, yeah. uh, have you played there yeah. sort of a lot? I'll uh, tell you what's behind that. Uh, I'd taken the instruments over. I didn't get it wasn't a paid gig, but I, I'd taken the instruments over with the hope of getting a blow. And we found a band, small band playing in this very big restaurant. And I went in and I, could, I had no instruments with me, they were in the hotel. I said, I'm a sax player from Manchester, any chance of coming out and blow? Yeah, go and get it. I said, no, he said, I'll bring it in tomorrow. Yeah, to yeah, we're here tomorrow night. I'll bring it in tomorrow night. So I did. So I in and played, uh, do you know what it means to Miss New Orleans, which is real super tune, and, and one or two t t very traditional tunes. And then I started putting me sax away. He said, what are you doing? I said, well, when you get sisters in, I know what it's like. You can't get rid of them because they won't go away. Because you know, our own bands have sisters in it. Mm. Oh, they won't. So I said, I'm not good. Oh, no. He said, he put the sax row back together for me. He said, hey, come on. And I played the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't want to impose. Yeah, exactly. As yeah. you knew yeah. other people had imposed on, uh, yeah. on your band, yeah. right? And you, you say, right, some Fred Smith comes and plays. and says, right, thank you very much, Fred. And you think you take your bow and go, but no, <laughs> carry on playing. Yeah. <laughs> Clear off. So did you get that quite a lot when you were playing? Other musicians come up and say, can I can Not I so play? much now, but yes, definitely. Yeah. And how did you deal with that? I mean, did you, you ever have, have to... take part a lot. You didn't know what you were going to get. And so have, <laughs> did, you, did you ever turn down people that you wished afterwards that you had Well, hadn't. you'd just let them play one tune. Yeah. No, but did you ever say, no, you can't, and then oh, find no, out no, that, no. oh, I wish you'd let him play? No. Oh, well, there was one the case I was telling you about the, the when we were playing at the uh, Tommy Ducks in Manchester. All right, go on. And the lady came up and said, I've got a brother in America, or a cousin, some relative in America. She has a post office in Walden, and he's coming over could he come and play with your band? So I didn't know anything about this, I was told this later. It turned out that the band leader had thought, oh, we, don't, we don't know the hell it's going to be, no way. She said, he said, I'm sorry, no, we don't, we don't have citizens, we don't, don't, it's not custom for us. It turned out to be the guitarist with Stan Getz. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God. Charlie Bird. Charlie Bird? Yeah. So this is Charlie Bird, Bird spelled B Y R D. Yeah. Yeah, Charlie Bird is. And, she turned, and he's oh. just. He's, I, thought, I don't think he's with us now. No. But he was a brilliant player. Oh, boy, was this. <laughs> the one that got away. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> now, you, let me just clarify that venue that you said to us, the brewery, yeah. is that where you ended up playing all night? Was that Yes, the... yeah, the Crescent City Brewery. And what was, what was it about that venue that you, you liked or loved? It's right in the middle of the, of the, 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 uh, the district, what they call the district in New Orleans. It's the centre of where, where it all happened. Yeah. New, New Orleans is, uh, what's it called, the district? I can't remember its name now. Storyville. I think it is. Okay. It's built about 12 feet above water level. So when the river flooded, it rarely got wet. Yeah. But then they started developing the city and building where they shouldn't have built. And that's, right. that's where they, they get the floods. Yeah. For, for a saxophonist, it sounds like a random question. Are there certain um, architectural things that make a, a venue sound better oh yeah so, so yeah. do you have a, you know a, a, a favorite venue that you prefer because the sound you know yeah. the sound what, what are well, those things um, then? the masonic hall in manchester has got a great big dome right and so it reflects and if you stand in the focal point of this this reflector yeah. you can make some terrific sounds you can't hear it outside don't sound any different outside but when you're underneath it it sounds dynamite you know? when you're still playing there yeah. and so what about your worst venue oh. what about a venue that you just <laughs> right um, we'd be playing in Munich to four and a half thousand five thousand people what and we came back to a place in Blakely and played for 45 people. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a big night for them, 45 people. Yeah. <laughs> so it wasn't so much the actual venue, it was the fact that you just played to four and a half thousand yeah. people in Munich. Well, what, was, what was that? 
What, it, it, that, the bee, that, the bee, that was the beer that? garden. The, what? The beer that, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the band is on stage in front yeah. of an entire garden of beer. But the, yeah, but the garden was... It's a beer garden, it's enormous. It's a forest. It Valvirchaf means the inn in the forest. But I didn't know it was four and a half thousand people. Yeah. Well, it was so busy that the, the people around the place were complaining because the car parking was dynamite. The people would park a mile away and walk. And it was a very, very wealthy district. So they got up in arms and complained to the local commander at the uh, council. So the council came in uh, and put it down a ruling that they should reduce the seating. So they, they wouldn't have four and a half thousand. So they did reduce the seating, but four and a half thousand people still came, but just stood up. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. They're not down. They're not down. That sounds like parking a mile away from Heaton Park so I can get in and see New Order the other yeah, week. <laughs> but in Dresden, they had the thing that had previously been an amphitheatre. And that had 7.5 uh, thousand in it. And you've... I've got a picture somewhere. Oh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at that. I'll show picture. you that later. Yeah, we'll put we'll put any any images up on the website as right. well. Um, well uh, but this place, uh, it was full except for some reason we never got to the bottom. The tiered seats and there's one row, was an end seat down each one empty. <laughs> so we complained. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't complain. What are they empty for? Come rows on. and rows and rows and rows of them, and all uh, all the way down to the bottom. So the one end seat empty. No, no, that's Just in case. Thing. Yeah, well, I don't know. I love that. I love that. Another venue would be nice to go to BB King's Club. In, oh right, in, yeah, Memf yeah. in Memphis. Have you played? There? No, I, I played across oh. the road in a in a restaurant called the Italian Fisherman. Right. But then we, when we'd finished, um, he said, "Where are you going now?" I said, "Well, we're going to try and get in BB King's. You will never get in. It's packed." Yeah. Hello, I've got two guys, four guys coming over to. And they let us in. Oh, gave, really? us, gave us a piece of paper to go in. And, and I didn't did you, play there, no, no. But you were actually, can you remember who you saw there? Just top Americans who were unknown to me, but I top decided, player. Okay. But the, the brilliant sax player there, I mean, he was absolutely dynamite. And he was big as a house, and I said to him, I got chatting to him, I said, you know, you should be on baritone. He said, I had one, but it was stolen in London. Oh, <laughs> no. So he was waiting for the insurance company to cough up, but because it, it was stolen out of the country, they weren't paying. But he was some player, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, um, favourite players to, uh, to, to oh, see live? I've played, well, I've played here with um, Ernie Tomasso from London, Jim Douglas out of the Alex Welsh Band, Digby Fairweather, who used to do yeah. jazz on the radio, perhaps he still does. Yeah, was he Radio 3, I think? Possibly, yeah. yeah. Um, Kenny Baker, I played with. Yeah. Alan Barnes, Danny Moss. Oh, I, I, I listened to Danny Moss. I didn't play with him. Tommy Whittle from Glasgow. Yeah. You remember him? Yeah, yeah. And you played with him? Well, just you wind up on a gig and uh, he'll come in and sit in, or you know, if you get somebody like that asking to sit in, you don't turn them down. No, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> no, you bump into people. I mean, there was, there was a band on the Wirral and. Uh, a venue on the world rather that brought all sorts of big names and we played in a small club in, just off off the world and this 
club sent their musicians to play with us every time they got just to give them another gig before they went home. You yeah. Know? So I got to play with all sorts of people that uh, mm. name name players, you know. Yeah. I played with Humphrey. Uh, no, no, I'm not played with Humphrey. Uh, I thought you were going to say Humphrey Littleton. Though. Yeah, well, I've, I've not played with him. I've I've I've, I've you seen, seen him? him play, but uh, the guy that's just trombonist has just died. He he had. Um, well, think about that one if we if we remember Will. Bill Ball and three Bs, weren't they? But don't let us down, Chris. <laughs> this nerd, the, 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 the pressure Barber. is on. Chris yeah. Barber. Well, I played individually with two or three of the, his players when they've come over and, yeah. and joined in. You know. Wow. Uh, you have to think hard when you, yeah. you know. Well, do, do you know what? Along, along those lines then, Howard, we are now, and I say we, you, you are going to create your ultimate fantasy band. Okay? Now, Chris, how many members are we going to allow well, I'm, Howard to I'm going to allow six, and that includes Howard. So Howard is going to be playing sax, okay. um, but I would like you to name another sax player who will be playing alongside you. Well, he's um, dead now, but Getz. No, that's fine. Stan yeah. Getz, right. Yeah. Oh, he, he's going, okay, he's going yeah. straight in. Boom. Okay, so, so Stan Getz is going, to be, yeah. is going to be your sax artist, yeah. and the two of you are going to play together. Then we've got okay. um, trumpet. I, I was going to say trumpet, but trombone, if you prefer. I don't know what you prefer, trumpet or trombone. Trumpet, well, I don't know. This yeah. is your fantasy band now, Howard, so it's your ultimate. So who's going to be on trumpet you can have another. You can have another dead guy if you want, right. it's fine. <laughs> well, the, my opinion's changed in recent years. There's oh. a guy now, I don't think he's in Chelsea, but he plays with Minotsal Brass. Do you know them? No. You've got to find All right, this is going to be an education for me. Right? Minotsal Brass, and he's just incredible. Oh, he, he plays like Harry James, but better. Right, okay. So oh, he, wow. we'd have him on it. Yeah. You must look up Minotsal Brass. How do you, how do you spell M -N that? M-N-O-Z. I L. I think it's a Polish name. All oh, right. Well, I would never have got that. No, no, <laughs> M N O Z I L. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's their trumpeter. Well, they they the just brass. The three trumpeters, two trombones, uh, wind bass. It's only small. You know, yeah, you're only allowed one of them. No, I'm just saying that you for you, for your interest. You want to go? We're we're going to gonna check them, yeah, but yeah. for your fancy yeah. band, oh, well, well, who be, are you putting in? His names. Christian something or other. Okay, fantastic. Right, we will look He's that there. up. Now, who, who else are we going to have on stage? We're going to have uh, drums. Ooh, drummer. Benny Goodman's drummer. Right. Benny I'll Goodman's drummer. Um, he, he drummed on, my memory's going for names. He drummed on um, Sing, Sing, Sing. Right, I'm just, I'm just frantically Googling Benny Goodman drummer. Okay, um, we're going to, we're going to hold it right there. Here come straight back. Gene Krupa. Krupa. That's oh, it. Gene Krupa. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. He okay. was without phenomenal. A, without a doubt. Yeah. And, and uh, Teddy Thingamajig on, on Vibes. Oh, right, right. Um, see, I don't know many Vibes player. I know Milt Jackson from oh, the yeah, Jazz yeah. Quartet. Well, but I don't know Teddy. Out of style, Milt Jackson. Right, okay. I love that. I If, if I was going to play anything... I'd be on vibes. You, you're always on vibes. <laughs> I'm always Alex. on vibes. Alex always plays the vibes. <laughs> um, so you've got two more musicians you need to choose now. You've got a bassist, um, and I was saying to Alex before that if I say bassist, you will generally think yeah. upright bass. You yeah. won't be thinking of. Oh, no. No, no it'll be an upright. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so bass and keys. So somebody playing the piano. Um, Art Tatum on the piano. Yeah. Yeah, some player. You know him then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what's the other, on the bass? And on the bass, yeah. Um, Charlie Mingus. Oh, yes! Brilliant. Gosh, it had See, to be. that is a band. It had to be. That, yeah, that is on a the, On the band. back of the toilet door in the now demolished um, Big Jazz Club in Manchester, the whole um, of Mingus had been put out in... The full of second declension, Mingus, Mingus, Mingus. Have you done any Latin? No, no, no I haven't. Yeah, love that. <laughs> Brilliant. They get, uh, they get uh, graffiti, but it's educated graffiti. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's allowed. You're allowed that. No, I, I, I don't know if I've mentioned before, I probably have I've mentioned most things. 
and uh, one of my favourite ever gigs was Charlie Mingus Big Band yeah. um, in Manhattan yeah. um, and you must have met it it was incredible absolutely he, he incredible. didn't like uh, white men playing jazz really he didn't say they can't do it but they, they, they've got their own music and they should play it right they, they're good at playing orchestral stuff you were saying yeah yeah, yeah. He didn't uh, resent them playing, but he didn't think they should play. But jazz wasn't exclusively black. Yeah. It wasn't. I mean, the invention of jazz was a combined effort, you know, black and white. You know. Yeah, well, I mean, Joplin was was yeah. kind of instrumental in that yeah. as well, and a bit of Gershwin as well. So yeah. I mean, it's um, well, we're we're nearly at the end, Howard. This has been lovely. I really enjoyed this. this. <laughs> and so, I mean, the last question is something that we ask all our guests and it's um, either a live album that you can recommend, one that we should just go to before any others, or if there's a clip of um, you know, a band or an right. artist playing live on a, on a YouTube video, what would well, you recommend? I would say go on YouTube and stooge around. It's yeah. just a watch with all the best. It's hard to say an album because you don't know what people's tastes. Yeah. Right? But my, my undoubtedly my favourite album is Stan Getz with, with um, Charlie Bird, Charlie Bird the, the, the first bossa nova thing that came out, because it, yeah. it was a, a um, disc on a vinyl disc yeah. originally. It's on, it's, it's so on. For, for someone like me then, is that a good starting oh, point? Because right. I'm, I'm, well, I'm not a big jazz fan per right, se, well, I don't know. It's very easy jazz. on the ear, it's very okay. comfortable on the ear. But we want to. Most jazz musicians developed in the same direction and pace as jazz itself developed. They started off liking really simple New Orleans stuff, and just as jazz progressed, so does their taste. Yeah. So it's difficult to say what. It, do you want it as a historical thing and learn a lot, mm. or do you want to pick out your favourite dish? Well, I think you've you've chosen an absolute cracker there. Oh, right? yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's one on it called Samba These Days. Not some of these days, which is a tune. Yeah, but Samba, Samba these, these days. days. Yeah, I definitely want to check that out. Yeah. Do you know what? I'm I, I'm I'm interested, and I'm Chris. I'm going to break the Gig Stories podcast rule here because we normally finish with that question. Go on. And um, I I do want to ask. I, the, the, you've mentioned so many musicians there, wonderful musicians. Which of them? haven't you seen live that you would desperately love to see oh, live? I would love to see Benny Goodman, I'd love to see Stan Getz. They, they all rank, once you get up the top, you can't pick out. Yeah. They all rank, I mean, there's some are rank. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, once you get to the top, and there's so many, the names disappear. You see, I was in the workshop once at, when I was working for British Gas as an engineer, uh, electronics engineer, and there was some music playing. They said, "Oh, that's um, that's Louis Armstrong on trumpet." And this guy said, "How do you know it's Louis Armstrong?" I said, <laughs> "I just know his style." He said, "I I, I would have been hard pressed to tell that it was a trumpet." This problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you get when you've been immer immersed in it, you you, you can't find a favourite. Yeah. And you know what? I don't know if this question is answerable. And we'll, we'll finish on this. After 82 years, are you able to explain your relationship with music and what it, what it means uh, to you? I never agree with people for having a visual impression of it. For instance, Greg's Morning Suite. It doesn't say, I like the music, beautiful, but it doesn't suggest morning to me. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the tune Skylark. Yeah. It's a knockout tune, and the, mm -hmm. the lyrics are superb. But uh, I don't get a mental impression of a Skylark. There is one called, uh, I don't know who wrote it, called A Lark Rising. Lark Rising, yeah. Now that does. Just yeah. very few do to me. That's fantastic. Yeah. You know the one. Is it, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it classical? Yes, the yeah, lark, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think um, Lark Ascending. Ascending, ascending. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Lark Sorry. Ascending, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It's Vaughan Vaughan Williams. Vaughan Williams. It is indeed, yeah, yes. Vaughan yeah. Williams. Yeah. So what? So that's what you've done. But what is what is your 
personal relationship with music? What well, is it's, your? It's the ultimate um, uh, unapproachable. You can't undis- indescribable. It's it's just it's there. It happens. And uh, what what do they call the kind of painting that you do? As opposed to representative, this abstract. Abstract. That's the word. Uh, yeah, it's to me, it's the ultimate abstract art because it's not telling you anything. It's just fabulous sounds, and very often sounds are only nice because they followed something else, a chord. So that's a fabulous. Well, it's just B flat minor seventh with that is nice, but it's where it came from. Yeah, the change, almost a change in colour. I love that. I love that. Howard, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. Really, really appreciate it. And he is hoping that you get to play some more gigs. Yeah, well, uh, once I get this foot sorted out. See, it's not the playing, it's the carrying the equipment in and out to the gigs. You see. Well, Chris has promised me that he'll carry all your equipment <laughs> to all your gigs. Well, I'd better get <laughs> some more practice. <laughs> with my back. <laughs> and, when, and when he does that, I'll be sat in the front row. Howard, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, what a great chat. Thank you, Howard. And also, today is... Friday, if you're listening to it on the day that this podcast goes out, and today is actually Howard's happy birthday to you, eighty second birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, Howard! If you're happy listening birthday, to this, mate. and yeah. thank you, thank you. This is your birthday present to us. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work. Doesn't does it? No, no it really doesn't. doesn't work. Honestly, um, I I was really conscious of of time when we were doing that interview and um i could have been there for another two three three hours and if he cracked out the whiskey we could have been there all night oh no yeah yeah, absolutely absolutely one thing i was going to say was um Mm. so at the start of the 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 chat um we got this photo out and I'll, i'll put it on the website oh yes yeah so that was new year's eve 1959 which was his first gig brilliant that i love that picture the first time i ever played with howard was was 1960 no it was new year's eve 1999 it was on millennium eve no way yeah so um his daughter my wife colette she sang and um, my wife my wife and he he was um it was his his band and and i i played so we were at warrington golf club on M- millennium eve you spent millennium eve at warrington golf club yeah i i love that yeah absolutely uh, keeping it real mate where where did you all spend your millennium eve i'd like to know actually that'd be quite interesting uh, yeah I I, yeah that's that's a good point actually because i would like to know if anyone was at any gigs on were there gigs going on or were they just these kind of ridiculous celebrations going on or what? are you taking the mick well what where was, was i on? where, where was you? i in the millennium stadium yeah what was going on there i don't know i was at warrington golf club <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't have broadband <laughs> am i going to know what's on at millennium stadium i was hanging out with nikki sean and james Oh, you were at the Manix. Manic, oh, right, Manic okay. Millennium, yeah. Oh, is that what it... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, I I know of uh, quite a few big, a few big ones uh, that were going on. And if I, if I remember correctly, there was a big night in London where I think um, the Prodigy bought in the new year. And I'll be honest, that that's probably where... No, I, I had a great time the Mannix of course mm. but if I could have seen anyone else I'd have seen the prodigy uh <laughs> in New Year's Eve but no I love that that's 40 years that um since he played his first gig and he he was playing it with his favorite son-in-law eh? <laughs> oh. yeah exciting news and you've got 
depending on when you listen to this, you've either missed it or... Or you've got two days. You've got two days or hours to prepare. Yeah. So as part of Tim Burgess's Vinyl Adventures Manchester on Sunday the 5th of December, we will be hosting a live episode of the podcast at the Deaf Institute. Ho, ho, ho. Get in. Get Deaf in. Institute in Manchester. And at half past two, we have none other than the man himself, the writer and creator of the theme tune to the Gig Stories podcast, Mr. James Holt. He's going to be performing some acoustic tracks. And then following him at approximately three o'clock, Chris and I shall wander on the stage as we have a chat with our very special guest, which is Chris. Longfella, Tony Walsh. Tony Walsh. Oh, Amazing. Brilliant amazing poet amazing man and is i think he's actually already a legend in manchester isn't he yeah and, and if I, not he, surely we give him the freedom of the city or something he, he should have that already shouldn't he well i was looking at um i i noticed that i'd contacted him before clint boone's episode went out Mm. about him coming right. on the podcast so um that's right we, we've been trying to get him on the pod for ages and ages and long ages. time long time um but and also i keep on bumping into him in heaton park when i'm walking the dog and he's he's just out having a wander and um with his wife and and he talks about music all the time music is obviously a massive part of his life he started going to gigs in the late 70s and went through loads and loads of different styles and loads of venues and has seen some amazing gigs so this is going to be a great chat I, it feels like I'm, I'm introducing the 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 podcast because we don't actually know when we're going to be putting this this podcast out if you can make it along to the recording that would be fantastic so like alex said come along for for james holt um and there are loads of other things going on in town as well but james holt at deaf institute at half past two we're on at three o'clock we might even have james playing our intro live i mean good luck I mean, to him doing that on yeah five six different instruments <laughs> yeah exactly but well, we'll see we'll see but also there's lots going on um, with uh, Final Adventures all over Manchester and Greater Manchester in Bury, in Altrinum. Piccadilly Station. Yeah, Piccadilly Station, Freight Island, 33 Oldham Street, uh, all the record stores. Uh, Royal Gorilla. Exchange, I think. Yeah, Royal Exchange. On the trams. So Tim Burgess's voice is currently uh, voicing the trams, which is just incredible. What a lovely touch by Transport Greater Manchester. So come and join us. And just come and join the fun. My my daughter's really excited. She's got a camera ready, and we'll be spending uh, Sunday in town. Oh, and it's free as well. That's what yeah. I keep on meaning to say. It's free. Yes, yeah, free. Just tip up. And there's oh, oh man, if you are a vinyl junkie, I don't think I can even say. I don't think it's been announced. There is a massive announcement of a vinyl release that you will absolutely want to get your hands on massive um and i can't i can't say uh anything such but, a oh, cheese you're such i was gonna say you're such a cheese no you're such a tease i am a cheese i am and you're a, tease. a cheese yeah. I'm a cheesy tease um, um so <laughs> that's that's vinyl adventures and even if you can't make it along on sunday we'll be recording it so it will be an episode we'll maybe have a little bit of of james's music on that episode as well and so yeah don't panic yeah this is our first live so yeah brace yourselves um and um so i can't finish the episode without talking to you alex about an encounter you had with a rather special musician yeah um so that's I mean, our I, time I had, up you you were in yorkshire you were in Yorkshire yeah. and you were at my uh, mum. Yeah. She's calling me for my tea. So you were That's at a petrol intimate. station. You were on your way to a Christmas okay. light switch on because obviously you were doing your CBB's um, 
um, <laughs> plunger. I have my, I have my CBBS hat on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, we have spoken a couple of times about when we've met famous people and more often than not, it's I don't you. say anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what, I'm the famous person, or I mean... <laughs> no, <laughs> it's you meeting a f- famous person. And more often than not, I don't say anything. And without sounding like an idiot, that's partly habitual, you know, because of my previous life as CBBS host and the fact that I still work immediately and see all kinds of people and could get very carried away. But... <laughs> But my, I was, I was really tested the other night, and um, I still regret. My wife and I, we came out of Shepherd's Bush Tube Station, um, however many years ago, not not forever ago, and stood there, literally looking lost, bless her, on her own, was Nena Cherry, and I, li- I. I died. I absolutely died. I could hardly move, and my wife was just going, "Why don't you come say hello?" I'm like, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't. Anyway, 10 minutes later, I still didn't. I walked away and she was gone. And do I regret it? Maybe. But yeah, I do. I wish I'd said hello, but I, you just got to leave people as well. So as I'm driving out of Weatherby service station on the M62, you know, it's, all, it's always a nightmare getting out of service stations. There's always a long route, isn't there? And you always have to pass the trucks and then the petrol station and then you're back onto the motorway. Well, walking through the truck bit towards the petrol station, I can just see two blokes. And I slow down at a giveaway, giveaway sign. And I look to my right. <laughs> and good job the window wasn't down. I just exclaim, oh my gosh, it's Paul Weller. It's Paul Weller. And I've got the three kids and my wife in the car. It's Paul Weller. So I have the reaction, the varied reaction from the back. Who's Weller? Who's Paul Weller? Who's Paul? Who's Paul? Who is he, Dad? Who is he? You know, very loud. And my wife's saying, just say hello. And they go, no, 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 no. Let's just carry on driving. She went, you never say anything. You will regret it. Say something. And I'm, oh, I can't do that. And as I'm saying that... <laughs> I'm I'm winding the window down, or I'm at least pressing the electric button. Comes down, and there, there, six seven foot away from me was Paul Weller, and I said, "Paul," and then I blew him a kiss, and said, "Love you," and then quickly drove off. <laughs> Let's hear it now. Paul, love you. <laughs> oh my god! You oh can my hear. God. You can hear the kiss I blow him. Paul, uh, Mwah. love you. <laughs> yeah, love you. It was higher than that, mate. Love you. I love you, Paul. <laughs> love you. <laughs> I love the jam too. <laughs> Oh, my God. And I've always wanted to style the council. <laughs> so I uh, was it the same night or maybe the night before I was at home? Not not home. No, the art centre in Manchester. And I, was, I was photographing for them. And it was the premiere of this new film, um, a documentary about Brian Robson. Go on. Get in, Robbo. Robbo. And I didn't really know who was going to be there that night. Um, but then I was... And I was luckily I wasn't having to be part of the scrum who were photographing on the red carpet. I was photographing for home, um, so I could. I, there was a, a lot of leeway in what I could. You could do photograph. what you want. Yeah, well, I was photographing the venue as a venue which worked really well as a, a premiere site for a, a you know for a film. Oh, Weller so. didn't turn up, did he? No, but everyone else. <laughs> Brian Robson was there, obviously. It was his film. Yeah, and, I'm very jealous. Um, Wayne Rooney was there and um, uh, Michael Carrick, the new, well, interim 
Man United manager and no um, longer, no longer. Um, <laughs> yeah, but then, but um, then Gaza turned up, and I was like, oh, bloody hell, Gaza. Uh, yeah, and Gaza. I, I, I love Gaza, even though he's, you know, I, I'm not a massive fan. Well, I'm really not a fan of Rangers Football Club, but that's neither here nor there. Um, <laughs> Doesn't matter but, though, does but it? But I, I do have a soft. I've got a soft spot for Newcastle, um, and um, and but I thought he was an incredible player, and so, he, he's one of the greatest footballers of our time. Yeah, absolutely incredible, and Hands you know. Down. Everything that he's gone through and um, stuff that he's overcome, and and bless, he was looking well. He was looking all right, and you know he was, he was on the coke, and he was, I mean, the Coca Cola, sorry. Um, and he was, you know, Brilliant. he just looked healthy. He was taking, it looked like he was taking care of himself. And um, but yeah, so I, I, I was being really professional because I, um, I wasn't going up to people and saying, "Can I take your portrait?" You know, "Can I take a quick photo for?" I was just, I was being professional, but I, I did go up and say, Paul, do you mind if I, I just want to shake your hand? You, um, big fan of your, da, 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 and no, um, no, 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 don't, don't you dare! Da, 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 da. That's all. That's what all. did you say? So, you shook his hand, and what did you say? I said, "Hi, Paul. Don't want to bother you too much, so I just wanted to shake your hand. I was a, a big fan of your, your, your playing, and I'll let you enjoy your night. That was it." And then just he said, "Want to shake your hand?" That's it. That's all. That's all. That was that was it. I think that's fair enough. And and I made it very clear that I didn't want to disturb him too much. And he was on his own anyway. So and he's like, "Did you blow him a kiss?" No, I didn't. But he did, did you say, tell him "You love him." No, I didn't. Um, but he he did say, "Do you want to take my picture?" I was like, "Yeah, okay." So I took his picture, and then I walk, walked away. That's how you do it, Alex. <laughs> so how? <laughs> <laughs> how, how did what so what should i have wanged my arm out the window uh paul i'd just like to shake your hand you should have at least gone for a high five <laughs> imagine high five yeah. weller weller doesn't high five no way I bet weller doesn't. but the, the 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 other funny thing sorry i was just gonna say so that this place home downstairs got really busy really mobbed and and everyone was there you know there was like sam allardyce and ron atkinson and oh my uh, gosh Darren all the wrong and yeah yeah um yeah all the wrong were there um, <laughs> but then i was trying to get past because i needed to get out to photograph um the red carpet again because i think there was some i think sir alex was just arriving oh. yeah but, but so but i couldn't i couldn't get past these two guys in the in the uh in the bar and so i had to walk around them and as i was walking around them i saw who they were bear in mind i couldn't get past these two guys they weren't talking to each other they had th their backs to each other and they were talking to other people but i couldn't right. get physically past them and i realized that it was steve bruce and gary pallister so <laughs> Shut. no I, c I physically couldn't get past them so <laughs> to this day to this baby. day they still won't let people pass them but it just it made me laugh out loud to myself that i couldn't get past steve bruce and gary pallister anyway, that is yeah. absolutely brilliant and i've saved that story to tell you just now because i know you're a united fan um, that is amazing it was funny. i love that team i love that team pallister and bruce ah oh. yeah so anyway so that, that was funny. so please <laughs> This is the Gig Stories podcast, share, by the way. <laughs> share, share with us the embarrassing times you've met famous people, just to make me feel better. If it's music-related, great. If it's football-related, just as great. So, uh, yeah, share them with us. And, you know, as always, say hello, keep in contact with us, send us your pictures, your ticket stubs, and uh, and pictures from gigs that you're going to and you can find us on facebook twitter and instagram at gig stories pod and we will be back very soon with another episode we've only got two more before christmas oh craziness yeah, yeah. craziness and our christmas one is a belter it's a belter and um, be aware that the christmas one might not go out on a monday as usual but obviously <laughs> This nope. one's going out on a Friday, so um, <laughs> on your toes. Yeah, things are all up in the air. 
exactly. Um, and one last thing, again, happy birthday, Howard. Happy birthday, Howard. And we'll see you next time on the Gig Stories podcast. Bye for now. Bye.